All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've got a good number of slides. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this last talk of the Science Circle uh, presentation season. Uh, honored to be able to talk again and to, again, continue this dialogue about thinking of Darwin's evolutionary theory mo updated with all the modern research and modern thought that goes behind it. So uh, again, talking about the role of sexual selection, and just to remind you, I'm Stephen Gazer. I uh, used to be a college instructor and now doing research in the private sector. So like my updating Darwin part one, I'm going to use as a scaffold for the talk a, another really well done and entertaining documentary called The Science of Sex Appeal. This was aired and I think produced by the Discovery Channel back in 2009. Uh, and it does just two things really well in terms of science documentaries. One, it actually takes you through the experimental design and conclusions. And I think for documentaries where a lot of science is telling you what, what we know from the science, they don't necessarily take you through how the science was done. And I think they did this really well. And two, it's actually really entertaining. So even though there's a lot of science that is covered here, they do these little intermingled vignettes that are couples talking about their relationships related to the science. And so anybody here who's seen When Harry Met Sally, that is a wonderful little part of that that they kind of throw in here in that same type of idea. So, uh, but of course, what I'm going to do is try and give you a little bit more and some background and some perspective from a scientist as compared to just say watching it straight through on the TV, which again, I do recommend you watch it. It's available, as far as I can tell, really only on Amazon and you have to purchase it. It used to be on Netflix, but it's not there anymore. All right, so just as a reminder and a backdrop talking about Darwin's theory of evolution is that there's this selective process in which there is variation among organisms in a species. And again, individuals and in species have this capacity to reproduce. And then there's selective pressures, things that cause some individuals to uh, be more successful at reproducing. Again, either in most cases due to death, but in other cases due to, say, competition. And those that, in general, over time, those with the best genes pass those on to their offspring. And again, it's very easy to figure this out. That the ones that are the best hunters, the ones that are the strongest, the ones that are the fastest or have the best eyesight, uh, these are all things that make very physical sense for how this works. But I just a reminder that things like disease resistance is also a very important uh, factor in survival of you and passing on your genes. Now, the strength of evolution and one of the driving forces and this is illustrated by Darwin's finches from the Galapagos Islands, is that in order to really be able to take advantage of more resources and not compete as much against other individuals within a species, as individuals diversify, and this is an example where beak size, strength, shape, can allow some finches to take advantage of different food resources. And so, again, the large ground finch, which is, say, one species, if individuals within that, that ground finch start eating cactus or other ones start eating buds or other ones start eating insects, then there's less competition for food. And this is one of these things that can drive uh, species into evolving separately. Again, accumulating traits that allow them to survive, but it's actually something that is diversifying individuals. Now, and this is, there's a concept here known as niche overlap, and that is how much competition you have for resources between two species uh, and how good you are, you are compared to other species determines survival. Now, one of the areas, though, where niche overlap, this concept is 100%, where there is the most competition, is actually within the species. And this is a concept that Darwin, and again, a lot of people, historians of science, credit Darwin as really coming up with some very smart lateral thinking to even come up with this idea is that, uh, and I'll just quote here, when the males and females of any animal have the same general habits of life, but different structure, color, or ornament, such differences have been mainly caused by sexual selection. 
That is, individual males have had, in successive generations, some slight advantage over other males in their weapons, means of defense, or charms, and have transmitted these advantages to their male offspring. And again, how does this fit into evolution? And of course, it is that the result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. So again, he proposed this idea that competition within a species for mates is very important for determining the evolution and progress of the species. Now, I do want to say that uh, this concept has been built upon and found numerous examples in the animal world so that it is not in any way disputed. Right? This is something that there are wonderful uh, model organisms showing this, showing how, for example, the peacock tail is an example of sexual selection. Uh, the lion's mane, uh, behavioral mating habits. And if you remember my last talk, we talked about the fruit fly, which has this mating dance in order to attract a mate. So, but I think, again, to make this a little more entertaining in terms of science dialogue, we're going to talk about humans. And what, of course, has really allowed humans to be a great model organism for this are a lot of new technologies. And you'll see some of these uh, mentioned during the uh, during my talk, if you watch the documentary. They're taking saliva swaps, and this is a way of measuring hormone levels, uh, basically sequencing DNA so you know what genes somebody has. There's this, Computers are a great thing. They can do this eye tracking and also uh, basically creating figurines and models of movement and shapes. And Photoshop, again, one of the best ways that we can alter perceptions of reality and change reality to what we want. Um, and then brain scans, neurophysiology, you can actually see what the brain is doing in real time. It's just this amazing thing as you provide different things. And of course, we'll talk a little about chemical isolation and air delivery for certain things. And so, uh, you know, Susan asks, you know, weapons, means of defense, or charm as advantages, where's the problem solving ability in that? Again, he's just mentioning some examples. And of course, intelligence and the ability to interact with the environment, uh, hunt prey, there are any number of things that we can talk about as advantages. Uh, but I just want to be, be clear that we're, we're gonna, for today's talk, we're going to focus on sexual selection. We can come back to it at the end. Uh, okay, well, okay, so your follow-up is talking about, you know, learned behavior. And again, one thing I want to keep, want just in print here is that learned behavior is still determined by the genetics of the ability to learn behaviors or the ability to incorporate information from your environment and turn that into action. So in a way, there is this nurture, but there is still a genetic basis for how well one can interact and, and be nurtured. Okay, so another little basic reminder of some physiology in humans. And what you see here on the left is the pelvis of a male, and on the right, the pelvis of a female. And the important thing being highlighted here is that the female pelvis needs to be... Uh, in essence, wider, and also able to accommodate, uh, in a more circular fashion, the passage of another human being's head from inside to outside the body. And again, that circumference, or that diameter, is typically in the range of 10 centimeters. And so the ability to actually also uh, have this elasticity in the pelvis, and all of the musculature that helps push a human head out of a body are all very important aspects that are, again, physiologically different between men and women. And this is an important thing I want to point out. There's a term here called sexual dimorphism. And so sexual dimorphism is when males and females of a sexually reproducing species have different physiology. And this is one way which is here. And just also another key reminder that I have here at the bottom is that in Homo sapiens and mammals, the burden of reproduction is much higher in females in so many ways. And if you guys want to throw in in local chat some examples of that, I'll start it off by saying, hey, nine months of carrying around an extra amount of weight inside the body is one. Anybody want to put in their two cents? Uh, how about, you know, uh, production of milk, lactation glands for breast, and then also breastfeeding for 
you know, one to two years. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are things that do get sacrificed during that period of time. Uh, again, these all are things having to do with ramping up and changing the physiology of the body to support, again, another life. So the key thing here also to, re to re remind you that in is that while there's a lot of investment in um, by the female for having a child, uh, it, there's also kind of there's also a, a, a reasonable uh, developments in many types of species of pair bonding where the male staying around to help raise a child is actually also an important aspect that develops in some species, although not necessarily all of them. So that's something to keep in mind, especially with humans. Okay, so one of the other uh, dimorphisms in the females is the menstrual cycle. And what this is, is uh, a, a preparing of the uterus in order to be able to bear an offspring to be able to nurture and support it, that occurs on you know, cyclical nature that has nothing to do with the phases of the moon. Uh, and then if implantation and pregnancy does not commence, is not successful, then it basically sheds and restarts. Now, uh, one of the key things, and this relates a lot to how we understand biology from this documentary, is that we can measure where um, women are in the menstrual cycle by measuring their hormone, hormone levels. And so um, this diagram shows again, estrogen, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, progesterone. These are all things that uh, can be measured, so we actually know this. And what's really important about this is that we think about successful reproduction and mating, is that there's really a span of about four days in which copulation with the male can lead to successful offspring, right? So there's this very narrow time. And one thing, or one way that evolution works is that evolution over time can try and optimize the behaviors of a female that are going to make them different in this period of time, the fertility phase, as compared to other aspects of the cycle. And in fact, it's, you know, mammals are, uh, humans are pretty fascinating. We're, we're, we're one of the very rare organisms that just are on a constant ovulation cycle. Many mammals actually just stimulate ovulation only after they have sex, whereas we are ones where um, the cycles, and in fact, there aren't necessarily any clear, prominent, obvious displays. Again, anybody who has lived in a neighborhood with cats, cats seem to know when other ones are ready to mate and be fertile, and you know those things are happening. So, again, we do have this thing that's a little bit different than a lot of other mammals uh, out there. Okay, and then the last concept, and this is a concept I come back to many times when I talk about biology, and I hope uh, people can recognize Dr. Strange Love that uh, of course the whole point of a doomsday machine is lost if you keep it a secret. Why didn't you tell the world a? Eh? And again, the point here, a doomsday machine is if you're attacked, then you basically deploy the doomsday machine automatically. You, you can't stop it, and it destroys the entire world. But if the, your opponent doesn't know you have it, then they don't know that that's a deterrent to their attacking you in the first place. And this type of concepts um, is important also in biology that, for example, if you are a species that is poisonous, it's not enough to just be poisonous. You also have to tell other species that you're poisonous. And you have to do it in a way that's detectable by the other organisms. So again, there's this interplay of display and detection that is, again, a key fundamental concept in biology. And of course, this also has to do with mating behaviors, mating habits. A lot of them are visual when we think about uh, visual species. Uh, some of them are chemical, and in fact, in many cases, there's this combination. Okay, so any questions about like the basis of what sexual selection, how it's different than natural, natural selection is before we get started? Yeah, there's a question about genetic determinants of um, pair bonding in a link, and I will hopefully remember to come back to that at the end. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about the science of sex appeal. All right, so one uh, concept, this is something that was shown with Kendra Schmidt, uh, a biostatistician, where she was looking at this concept of the golden rule, there's, there's, sorry, the golden ratio, and it's approximately a two-thirds ratio where um, 
the ratio of the small or the size of the small stick, the ratio of that to the bigger stick is equal to the ratio of that, sorry, the intermediate stick to the large stick, so two thirds. And she found that when she asked people to rate the attractiveness of faces, that she also could correlate that with how much they displayed various golden ratios in, say, the uh, distance between the eyes to the size of the eye. And that's what's shown here on the top right. And so this actually becomes a way of statistically modeling attractiveness and actually being able to, um, in a sense, understand the underlying physical features of the face that are correlated with attractiveness. And she came up with this modeling system, again, made a scale of 1 through 10, where someone like Kirk Douglas uh, comes out as a 7. Again, uh, so again, anything above a 6 is rated highly attractive. And this is a picture of one of her volunteers where the rating is, again, a little bit lower and more in the range of a four. And so what's important to keep in mind about this type of rating scale is that now with the power of Photoshop, we can actually take the same face and basically very precisely change those ratios within a face in a way to then resurvey question, uh, you know, people to ask them about rating attractiveness. Okay, now, uh, concurrently with this work, uh, Lisa DeBrun, DeBrine uh, was basically trying to take averages of faces and trying to really determine what is their underlying, what are the underlying features that display maleness versus femaleness. Now, again, I think in your own mind, if you were to think, if you were to look at any given face, uh, you look at that and say, that's a male face or that's a female face. And in some cases, you think about, you know, very specific individuals, you actually can't have this ambiguity. So again, sometimes if you watch movies or plays, people try and take advantage of this ambiguity of trying to, say, use makeup on a male to more to appear more female. And so, but again, she has this power to say, what is a maleness type feature versus a femaleness feature? And her experiment was this, that she had these individuals and the middle pictures, oh yeah, actually, let me ask a question. In terms of rating the opposite sex, which one looks the most attractive to you? All right, now you don't have to answer in local chat or anything, but just take a quick look and say, oh, the guy on the right or left is what I find more attractive, or the woman on the right or left is more attractive than to me. Sorry, I have to cough for a second. Okay. So what was actually done in the experiment? And sorry, I should mention that the, the picture in the middle is just the natural person's face. Okay, and the original in the middle and again, using these computer algorithms, they created a more feminized face by moving to the right, and they created more masculinized faces on the left. And when they surveyed people, in general, people found about 68% of the time when they were given a choice of the faces, they picked the one that was, again, a man would pick the more feminized face, and a woman would pick the more masculinized face. <clears throat> and so, again, one thing to go back to and remind you is that these Facial features in development uh, occurs or is highly modeled and influenced by the surges of hormones during puberty. So again, very young boys don't look very masculine, right? They don't have a lot of the square jaw and other features. Uh, the roundness of um, some girls' faces and the, the, the placement of the eyebrow, like kind of the placement of the eyebrows and the, the fleshy parts of a woman's face, those things change, again, as they go through puberty. But so again, these are things being modeled and influenced by sex hormones. Uh, okay. In addition, in terms of thinking about sexual attractiveness, let me ask you a question. Does this woman look attractive? So this is going to be a little bit like going to the optometrist. Which looks better, picture one or picture two? Let me go back. Picture one. Here's picture one. Ooh, how come my backbone's not working? 
Okay, picture one. Picture two. Yeah, so Sydney points out that in picture two, her eyes are even. And in fact, it's not just that. If you actually look at um, picture two, if you look at it very closely, how it was made was they just took a central line of symmetry and then just basically copied what we're perceiving as the left side of the face onto the right. So if you now look at the hair, if you look very specifically at the hairstyle, it's basically a perfectly mirror image of the left-hand side. And so again, this, the rating of symmetric faces is higher than asymmetric faces. <clears throat> okay, so let's go through one more example where I think this was, again, still Kenner Schmidt. She took men's, a man's face and a woman's face. Well, I'm sure she did more than, more than one each. And basically, again, use Photoshop to, again, objectively quantify the amounts of symmetry in the face using, again, a bunch of very specific individual points. And she surveyed people on a college campus. Which one do you find more attractive? All right now, she told them these were identical twins. And they even put them in different clothes. You know, they're in different clothes. They're the same person, but wearing different clothes. Let me just ask you, which one do you find more attractive? Which one do you find more attractive? And this is true for both males and females. You can look at both and say, which one's more attractive? And again, if you know where I'm going with this, you can actually look at the image ahead of time and figure out which one would, in general, be the correct answer. Yeah, so they are saying the woman on the left for the man, Sydney is saying the bottom right. And I, in fact, I that's agreeable. That what was done with the Photoshop images was uh, the woman's face on the left was basically artificially symmetricized, and the one on the right was officially skewed in terms of symmetry. And that kind of the opposite was face. That the symmetric face was preferred by 8 out of 10 people. 8 out of 10 people preferred this. And what's... What this actually is, again, symmetry in and of itself is not necessarily what is some sort of like ideal artistic feature of a face. What the research says is that the more properly programmed your hormonal surges were during your development, the more likely you are to be symmetric. Okay, so symmetry is not some sort of aesthetic quality. What it actually is is a marker, an indicator of a properly carried out developmental program by good genes. Okay. Now, again, there are other things that can influence symmetry, right? You know, there's things like nutrition. There are things like getting uh, your face punched out and having to get surgery. But as a broad indicator of this programming, this types of genetics, and again, good nutrition through youth as well, is what, and well, I shouldn't, and not just say in utero, but also during, you know, the surges of hormones that you have in puberty, that symmetry is something that says, hey, good genes. All right, uh, one other example of these modifications of how hormones can affect things um, is here's a woman's face. And again, I couldn't get this without the, the text involved, but day's ovulation 14. So again, another optometry situation. Um, do you prefer one or would you prefer two? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm giving this some time, Orange. I'll let everyone hopefully have a chance to res these. Well, again, these were taken on different days. So the researchers attempted to make her hairstyle and makeup the exact same between the two days, the two different times they took the picture. Okay, I'm going to go back to number one. Number one. Or number two. Yeah, Cog points out an interesting one that her skin glows more in the second picture. And what uh, the research says is that in general, if you ask men which one looks more attractive, it would be number two. And this is both a detection and display that the, the surges of hormones that are occurring that are important for, uh, say, developing the, the uterus, are also trying to display that this is a fertile period for her to men. And so to some degree, um, what's probably happening is there's a little bit more water content in her skin. 
There might be also a suppression of immune responses in terms of things like acne or things going on skin. And yeah, Aurora mentions it looks like there was a blur filter applied. It does, it really does, but they did not apply one. This is just a natural picture. And so these things that are occurring are, again, trying to create this, this, this image of vitality and youthfulness, and that's associated with this. But it's really just a display. I mean, you know, if her face were to turn purple, right? There are things that, like, baboon butts do, right, where... Um, you know, you try and change coloration during the right phase of your fertility when you're fertile. That you know, one could easily say, let's just have our faces turn purple when we're fertile. But that's not that's not how how it works. Okay, uh, another interesting set of research um, is this ability to. Oh, okay. So uh, Alora mentioned something, and that talking about um, birth control, the pill where it's a largely a, a large constant dose of progesterone. Um, I, there are some things where the pill knocks off the ability to display and detect these things, which they do mention in the documentary. Uh, I don't know more details about it than that. So let's just let's leave that to the side. But it is something that, again, the birth control pill, these changes in hormone levels do make uh, certain differences in how the cycle works. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, I have a dry throat today. Okay, so another these interesting technologies is asking, well, what physiologically, what, 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 what's the physicality that draws your eyes, right? What do you look at? And so this is some technology where they're using uh, basically things that scan your eyes and then can tell you on an image where your eyes are looking. Now, again, this is something that you have in a variety of, like, even, I think, game boxes now. And it's a way for people who are, say, paralyzed to actually be able to uh, communicate by looking at various letters on a keyboard. And you can track this, too. And so here's an example of a man looking at a woman's image. And the blue dots represent, again, some of the key areas and the amount of time the focus is spent in various areas. So, of course, looking at the face, scanning across the breast. And so one of the accumulated blocks of knowledge from this is that a researcher, again, her name is Carrie Johnson, although I couldn't find the couldn't find her on the web. She developed these models that she tried to make them basically genderless in terms of, say, hairstyle, clothing, and that's what she's in the top right. She asked people, well, is, is something a male or female? Does that look like a male or female to you? As a way of saying, what are standard basic male versus female characteristics? And something we know from physiology and something that she saw in these models is that this ratio of the waist to the hips is something that is very indicative of the female. And again, this comes back to the idea that women develop in a way that they have wider pelvises. And so this is, of course, something that would be a normal developmental program of, <clears throat> uh, you know, reproductive success. Now, what was actually very interesting, though, right? So, so that was generally tracked with what you'd expect. But one of the interesting aspects of her research was, as she asked men what was the ideal, like, shape, uh, it ends up being this 5 to 1, this 5.5 to 1, 1 to 2 ratio of waist to hips. Now, if you look at that, you're probably thinking, that does not look healthy. How could you breathe? And again, is there anybody, is there a certain fashion trend from, say, Europe in the past few hundred years that this is reminiscent of? Yeah, corsets, right? The whole idea of the corset was to really cinch up the waist to basically recreate this ratio. So again, this is something that fashion has been doing for a long time, is trying to recreate and make women more attractive in an artificial way uh, by taking advantage of these things that our brains think of as being most attractive. Now, the conclusion from the research was the idea that, well, if you think about a model in motion, and when you think about how men actually evaluate a woman's, say, pelvis and waist, it's not when they're just standing there. It's actually when they're walking, right? That, again, if you think of these standard pictures of a woman walking past a guy, he turns around and looks at her, and he's actually walking, watching her walk. And that's a part of the, the movement, the display. Um, so in the research... Oh, Tuyo uh, says, you know, can a woman with a narrow waist be indicative of someone who eats less and costs less to feed? I, again, I, I'm not aware of any sort of 
sexual selection modeling that says that that would be necessarily a valued or desired trait over just obvious physiological factors. All right, so the experiment here was they took volunteers and they put them on a treadmill and said to half the women, you know, we're putting you on a treadmill and what we're going to have is a, a person evaluate your, your walking gait, you know, for whatever reason. Is it a good gait or a bad gait? And then the other half of volunteers, they said to them, you're going to walk in this treadmill, and then you're going to be evaluated for how sexy you walk, right? So this is, this is one of these mind games that the research, that's kind of a great research example where the subject really doesn't know what's being evaluated. And so the results of the research was showing that women told that they're being monitored for their gait. They kind of walk normally, you know, a little bit stiff, straight-backed. But the women that were told they were being evaluated for their sexiness were shifting and walking in a way that was accentuating their butt movement. And so um, this type of, of thing is that there's this subconscious, or maybe, maybe in some cases they were conscious, but this subconscious idea that in the right environment, the right situation, that you're going to try and accentuate and display your wares in a way because you are uh, told that that's actually something being, being looked at. And this was also true for men. This was not true just for women. But in the same case that men told that they were being evaluated for their sexiness of their walk, they put a lot more of that, that swagger, that swagger look that you have. Um, and just since we're here in Second Life, I do want to mention that, you know, one thing that we do in Second Life is that we wear um, animation overriders, right? And we actually can choose what sort of gait we have when we're walking around. And so one thing to keep in mind is that when you have these choices, this uh, one, you might be subconsciously choosing different gates uh, depending on your second life situation. Uh, here in Science Circle, you're not necessarily trying to uh, attract a mate. You're, you got, you're focusing on other things. Uh, but you actually might be choosing different AOs when you're in different situations, different, different, different items. All right, so another great research study. And this was, again, this idea of a mating game. Again, how do you actually choose and evaluate a mate, especially when you have competition around? And so the experiment here in, uh, with Douglas Kenrick is taking volunteers and basically desexualizing them as much as possible. They put them in uh, very boring clothes. They covered up their hair. And what they actually gave them was a number, right? So these numbers that are pasted on their forehead is saying uh, the smaller the number, uh, the more desirable the person is. And, and the game you're playing is trying to um, get the best you can, get the best number that you can. And then what was interesting, of course, is that any given volunteer didn't know what their own number was, right? So what this experiment was really trying to evaluate is within this, like, mixing and matching, do people have this capacity to not just to kind of get a sense of what their own attractiveness is? And that way they're trying to trade or they're trying to, to, to acquire the best thing that they can, given what their own number is, even though they don't know what the number is, but they can evaluate and take a guess at that based on their interactions with others. Okay, and so the results were that people do tend to number match. That if you looked across this in multiple trials, the number matching was very close. So you see a pairing here of a 10 and a 9, and a matching up of a 2 and a 3. Now they actually did this, and they replayed this experiment, where they actually took the volunteers and asked them to evaluate the physical attractiveness of the opposite sex, and then told them, you know, take off the hair stockings, walk around, uh, try and smile, you know, do all those things that you do, and pair off. And in fact, what they showed is that this pairing mechanism of, of or number matching of basically, you know, acquiring and pairing off at your own rating was actually consistently uh, seen within within these trials. And so I think this is important here is that, of course, your strategy, of course, would always be to trade up as much as you can uh, to acquire a higher number, but that you do have the sense and evaluation of what you are or are not going to going to have in the end. There is one other thing I didn't want to say about this, of course. That one thing that they're not doing in this trial is trying to use makeup, hair coloring, other things that we artificially do to our <clears throat> uh, perceived attractiveness that are, in a sense, artificial. But, of course, in the real world, these are all things that do happen. And, again, part of trying to, to trade up. Okay. Uh, in terms of physicality, there are other things. I don't want to say all mating is about what, what someone looks like. Okay, so here's another quick example. Again, other features that, again, do we necessarily associate these with um, 
this mini game and how do we know that they work this way in sexual selection? And so this researcher was basically taking voice recordings and asking others to evaluate which voice do they find more attractive. Now what they would do, of course, is take the same voice and just use, you know, audio software to change what it is. So it's not that it's a different person's voice. It's the same person's voice, but just modulated differently. And of course, deeper male voices were preferred by females and higher pitched voices were preferred by males. Sorry, higher pitched female voices were preferred by males. I got a typo there. And now, what is this actually trying to, to, to say? Is that one thing that the reason why men have deeper voices is because testosterone disproportionately compared to females lengthens the larynx during puberty. And so again, is there any value to per se having a deep voice in and of itself? No. But what it is, is it's a, it's a display of the hormonal surge that is maleness. And so again, I don't think it's necessarily just having a deep voice because of course really tall people have naturally deep voices because they have very large larynxes. So I think there's a little bit more subtlety to this. And I've uh, listened to some research that, that suggests it's the case. It's not merely a matter of, you know, what frequency your voice is working at. Um, and so, for example, if you think of someone like Andre the Giant, who had acromegaly, uh, if somehow deep voices, he had a very deep voice, if deep voices were somehow to become a very strong sexual selection and sexual advantage, then if he were to be more successful reproducing, he would also be carrying on a disease state gene. Right? And this is one thing to keep in mind. I saw, I'm trying to respond to something that they said in text a little bit ago about the costs of how um, sexual selection works. And there are times where if somehow the perception of a sexual trait becomes too strong in a population, that there are any, say, physiological downsides to that, then that can be carried along and can actually lead to fitness de defects. Uh, there are some interesting subtle things about the voice research. Is that female, the preference of a female for the deeper voices is actually influenced by where she is in her menstrual cycle. Again, there's this little bit of physiology she's keen into. But also the female's voice pitch that she's displaying is also influenced by her menstrual cycle. So women that are in that fertility phase will tend to actually uh, accentuate and up the, the frequency of their voice via higher pitch. So I think that's kind of an interesting bit of research as well. Okay, so let's rate some men. Let's think about other factors that are really important for having successful offspring. And this is one, of, again, another one of my favorites from the, from the research. Here are three men. Is um, just, again, their rating from that study, just looking at their physical attractiveness. So we have a nine, a four, and unfortunately, not even a number. All they said was, here was the guy with the lowest rating. So kudos for him for agreeing to still be in the documentary. Now, what they did with these women is they, I'm sorry, with these pictures of these men, is they then associated what their professions were. And can anybody guess what effect, how much money they make in what they do would influence their attractiveness? Sorry, Ariana, I don't know who Edith Piaf is. Yeah, so here we go. If you take a nine, and turn him into a retail clerk that only earns $23,000 a year, he very quickly becomes a four. And you take someone who's a four and make him a music industry executive earning a quarter million dollars, he becomes an eight. And you take the lowest physical attractive guy and turn him into a, an entrepreneur with earning even more money, he becomes a 10. And so uh, Sydney points out what, what this is really saying is that women, they, of course, they physiologically evaluate how they, um, what their mating success can be, but they definitely have, because they have such a huge investment and because they're trying to get the best they can for their offspring because of their strong investment, they want someone who can also strongly support them. And again, in older, you know, pre-civilization periods of time when people didn't have incomes, then of course, where a man's status was in some sort of system would, of course, be very determinative of that as well. Um, so if you get, I think if you think about the Indian caste system, that's the type of thing where, um, well, again, they force uh, marriages within a caste. There would still be this, like, if there were an ancient more caste system in older man, then you'd be trying to trade up in caste as well. Okay, so um, what are some of the, what are some of the next research? So uh, the, the, 
And they spend a lot more time in the documentary on the first parts. Uh, so I'll go through these a little more quickly with fewer slides. But this one here, and this is something that you guys might have heard about, is what's, you might have asked yourself, what's the deal with women smelling men's t-shirts? Again, this has made the popular news every once in a while. And the idea behind this research is that, and what they were doing in the experiment was they're having men wear shirts, get them all sweaty, and then they, again, contain the smell within jars and ask women to smell them. Now, in general, when, um, oh, so Baragon also points out something interesting, too. In primates, the female will mate with high status, but then often cheat with low status males, especially if the low status males have, again, you know, certain physical characteristics that are very attractive. And that's one thing is that men, males don't necessarily know who their offspring are. So uh, that's something that, again, women still can create diversity physically. And then especially if the first mate, the one who is a good provider, can then raise this other offspring, even if it's not theirs. Okay, but let's go back to the, the smell research. Uh, and they asked women to rate the smell. Now, in most cases, women did not find this very attractive. But in a small number of cases, they found women that, during their fertility phase, would find the occasional shirt actually attractive smelling. And so, um, uh, what, what, what was the underlying feature here? There, there was a guess that the researchers had, which was that when they took a look at the DNA of the men versus the women, where the, there was this attraction signal, they found that the diversity of the major histocompatibility complex was higher. And I don't want to go through the biology of major histocompatibility complexes, uh, but the bottom line is that it's been shown that an individual who has more diverse of these molecules, and they, they, again, these are highly polymorphic, they are variable within the, the human population, the more diverse they are, the more fit you are. You have a better immune system, and it also correlates with longer, healthier lifespans. And so what the researchers are concluding is that somehow there is a signal and detection via sweat, again, via the, the compounds that you find in the combination of sweat and the bacteria that are in armpits and on the body to somehow signal this diversification of MHC classes. And of course, this leads to healthier offspring. Well, again, a single detected specifically when a woman is fertile. Again, this concept, this is known as pheromones. Pheromones are something that are, again, well documented in, in insect species and other organisms, uh, but still somewhat controversial within humans. Uh, yeah, and again, I think one thing if you think about it, I actually told this to a student one time when I was teaching, it's like, you know, if, if you can find that your, your guy smells nice to you, that you just like his smell, everything else will work out. Just everything else works out if you like his smell. All right. Uh, there actually is a kind of, kind of a flip of the situation where, and I might have actually double-clicked here, that there are these compounds that researchers have detected in females known as copulins. And um, the copulins what they've shown in this research here, they're, they're, they're feeding these copulins to men through a contained air and asking them to rate the attractiveness of females. And what actually happens is they lose the ability to distinguish attractiveness. So women that were formerly being rated as eights suddenly becomes fives, women who were threes are also becoming fives, that there is some sort of physiological effect of these copulins, which again, I will just mention, uh, not probably a word you hear very often in those conversations that are derived from vaginal secretions. Um, yeah, Aurora asked, was that really the best sample source? Again, I, the thing is, I don't think that there are necessarily, they know these compounds exist, but in terms of trying to purify large quantities for these experiments, you end up usually just providing a mixture of these smells. So again, I don't know that you can go to Sigma Aldrich now and buy copulins as some sort of specific compound. Um, but again, a lot of times you just have to go with kind of a raw source that you know is, is the origin of it. So speaking of brain physiology, uh, there is a lot that we now know about how the brain reacts, and the chemicals are important for this. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. So uh, Aurora, again, the, ju just because in the experiment they're deriving them from vaginal secretions, that doesn't mean that in a social situation, like a bar or whatever, that copulins can only be detected from that source, right? That would be a very 
awkward, of course, social situation. What's actually going on is that there are levels of copulence that are being coming out of, of sweat, coming out through the air. These things have to be something that are aromatic, uh, but just for experimental purposes, they derived them from a higher concentrated source, if that was the confusion. Um, and so again, something we now know is that in many ways, the early phases of being attracted to someone really is this related to dopamine. And again, dopamine is something that we know is related to addiction. And again, I put addiction in quotes because I think that, you know, you, you want to be a little cautious of equating something like dopamine as a sexual behavior response to, again, how it also could be triggered by, say, things like cocaine or what's also now known sugar. But again, people have monitored brain scans and found this ventral tegmental area where when women or men are just have, in those very early periods of, of lust and desire of meeting somebody new, these things are firing, right? These are things that our brains are doing physiologically. Neurons are firing to say, hey, this person's great, right? And that's partly because the brain is integrating a system of saying, you know, we've subconsciously detected all these things. And, you know, your consciousness, probably not good at evaluating mates as we are at all the things that have been occurring during millions of years of evolution. So we're going to fire neurons and try and tell you, hey, just keep, keep, keep hanging out with this person. Keep, keep getting with this person. Um, and so, but interestingly, of course, in organisms that have where there, whatever reason over evolutionary time has selected a pair bond, where, again, the combination of the male sticking around with the female to more successfully raise offspring, they've actually found these physiological responses that lead and help uh, drive this pair bond. And so the example up here is looking at uh, vasopressin, which is this compound that's actually involved in other roles of ph physiology and hormone, actually are involved in, you know, the constriction and vasodilation of blood vessels. Uh, but it, this is a common theme in biology where one compound can be used for multiple roles within, within the body. And that they actually see differences in activity between the promiscuous vole brain versus the monogamous vole brain. And what they also talk about in terms of humans, they have this couple that have been together for, I think, like 30 years. They're a really cute little couple. Um, the guys, I remember the guy's name was Peter. And again, they, they've taken couples like this and looked at their brain and tried to, under, tried to understand uh, what is this long-term love? What is the brain physiology of long-term love? Um, and so there's this region of the brain, there's the caudate nucleus, which seems to be involved and is fired in these longer pair bonding um, situations. But what's actually interesting about this particular couple and the research that was being done by um, Lucy Brown and Helen Fisher is that in some of the individuals, you actually see that dopamine has come back, that dopamine is being surged at a constant level. So these feelings of like, addiction and satisfaction uh, for your mate is something that comes back. Because actually, this is something, anybody here, there's a Marilyn Monroe movie, which is a concept in marriage that people, anybody offhand know the movie I'm talking about? This is something that's actually in marriage circles. Something known as the seven-year itch. And so, um, this idea of the seven-year itch uh, is something that the researchers were showing that what actually happens is within, uh, you know, within two people who have decided to have a monogamous relationship, that dopamine levels can start to trail off in about four years. And so this idea of satisfaction, this like addictive type quality, is something that can fade. Uh, again, people have suggested it has to do with the lack of novelty. It's the same person over and over. And so the researcher is suggesting that what really occurs in these very long-lasting uh, pair bonds is that you have this, like, maybe constant novelty or something where people approach it in a way that they're always finding them interesting and new, and so that other, like, attractions and whatnot do not get distracting. Uh, Barry got mentions, yeah, dopamine serotonin. You know, there's this bias in thinking about research that because we've identified certain compounds that we know work really well, doesn't mean there aren't tons and tons of other, other molecules or tons and tons of other states of molecules that in combination are very influential and important. So, uh, okay, so 
Um, again, it's not all love and roses, though. And like in the marriage game, and this is something they talk about at the end of the video, and they don't go too much into the research, is that, of course, one thing we do have are mating signals with body motion and showing skin. Again, this is something that, again, in terms of modern scientific experimental design, you can quantitatively measure these types of things by using motion capture, as well as looking at Photoshop images and looking at proportion of skins, and what about? Um, okay, Dar, uh, yeah, I'll try and come back to that in the, in the conversation phase. I think this is um, good to realize that we do have this physiology, but of course, we, in terms of what we evaluate as being valuable in a mate and having successful offspring, there are other more complicated things going on. Um, okay, so again, what was, now what was interesting about this research was that they were showing that even married women during their fertility phase, um, and I don't know if they necessarily measured the number of offspring, that they would actually show these additional mating displaces during their fertility. And so the concept here, and this is still, I think, a bit theoretical, I don't know what the current research is, but that married women still like the look of masculine men and are kind of like, as we mentioned earlier with apes from the local chat, is that there might still be this uh, idea that for some women, in terms of having successful offspring, that they might still be in a mating game, even though they've already are in a marriage or are already in a pair bond mating that has or is supposed to have offspring. Okay, so that kind of concludes, um, I think, the main pieces of research from the video. There actually are a couple other little items and tidbits from, that I've picked up that I want to talk about before we just conclude. And that is this next one is an interesting one, where there's this paper, this research study that made a splash. And this is actually done by business people. These are economists. Uh, where they looked at the fact that strippers, or pole dancers, and lap dancers were elevated. Their earnings were elevated during their fertility phase. So again, they were measuring this. They were measuring the exchange of money. Again, something that you can quantify is the exchange of money. Um, Um, so, suggesting that, again, there's both, maybe a, com a combination of both the, the, the extra movement and display to be more sexual from the woman, and then perhaps also the males picking up on these signals to then say, I'm going to give you more money. I'm going to show you how much more I can say, you know, how much money I have to do this. Uh, so, we were, again, coming back to the idea of the mating signals. Again, the only effect that this particular documentary talked about in terms of birth control was that when the, the ability for women to pick up on the scent of an MHC class diverse male was lost. Uh, again, I don't know, the, the documentary did not go into that research more, and again, something that, you know, you can always try looking up, but I don't know offhand either. Um, okay, and then another little interesting thing that I want to mention is oxytocin. So again, talk about chemicals, talk about hormones. The oxytocin is something that has been put out in the popular media quite a bit as well, that, again, we know it's involved in pair bonding. We know it's involved in feelings of trust, involved in feeling of relationship, both for men and women. And I don't want to go much into it, but this is one of those ones where, you know, there's a lot of interesting quantitative data you can put into this to really understand the physiology about oxytocin affects men and women. But this is one where the ability to detect the surges of oxytocin, again, in women, especially during fertility, post-fertility, uh, or post-birth, post you can actually measure these things. Um, and then, of course, the last thing I want to talk about, these factors, all these horm hormones, this physiology, and again, uh, uh, there's a bit of text from, from Dar. What are other things that are indicative of success? Especially, remember, we're now in a culture where our brains might want to adapt to things that aren't just physiological, right? They're not just the caste system, not just some guy's strength and testosterone surges. Maybe other things like intelligence, or maybe other things like humor. And so this is, again, this is a tiny thing. This was highlighted, I think, most recently with that um, the, one of the SNL, um, Pete Davidson, who, again, let me just say, it's a part of his bit to remind everyone in the audience that he's an unattractive guy. Okay, but I've always found him really funny in Saturday Night Live that he just got engaged uh, this week or last week to Ariana Grande, again, a woman considered, uh, I think, in the music industry, again, 
an example of a very pretty young woman. So these guys are now engaged. And so the idea of humor intelligence is something that's also being further studied. Remember, a lot of this research that's kind of basic biology uh, has, was done in the early 2000s. And so we're still in that phase of research, again, post the timing of this documentary, which is now, you know, nine years old, of what we actually now understand is these, these interactions that occur between males and females. All right, so just in summary, I just want to remind people and point out that this is actually kind of important stuff, right? That the way we interact with people, the way we're trying to be evolutionarily successful, and the way we've been programmed, the way our physiology, our brains, our genetics has programmed us from basically the dawn of being a mammal, or maybe maybe just, and also maybe being a primate. These are things that drive our behavior. And so the reminder that attractiveness is this display of developmental correctness and fitness. And that, of course, you have to have these ability to detect this in the opposite sex. And this fires in our brains a rating system. Uh, genetic diversity, something that we know is important for offspring success, is something that is basically something that can be put out there, displayed, and detected. Um, and that these are things that we can actually detect physiologically with both neurochemicals and brain scans that we really just understand this. And that, well, now that we are, our species in general has a strategy of pair bonding to raise what are difficult to deal with in many ways offspring up through the age of 18, and now in some cases still staying at home through the age of you know, 55, that these other types of changes and differences are things that can affect culture and interaction. All right. so. I will conclude there, and thank you all for your attention. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, I think this is something that when we, when Darwin proposed the theory of evolution, you know, there's a lot we've learned since then. And so it's important in the conversations about, about what we think of this evolution. There are, there's a lot more we now know. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thanks for coming, Day, Mike. Aragon, Serena, again, thanks to Chantal and Jossum, Jess, for organizing and hosting. Yeah, I, okay, so, I mean, the documentary doesn't really cover, you know, the concept of homosexuality. And I, I think I'm also going to just purposely bypass what could ultimately be a very difficult conversation. But I think that, um, thanks for coming, Aurora. Um, yeah, I, again, the, from, from, a, from a basic biological programming point of view, Homosexuality, strictly enforced, does not lead to successful offspring. And so I think the way one thinks about that concept from a biological perspective is very complicated. Um, but certainly, and I don't know, but I would presume that, again, let's say you, your, your brain behavioral status update is that you do find same-sex men, or, or sorry, as a man, you find men attractive. What are the things that lead to the things you find most attractive? And I think, you know, when you think about the, again, my very basic understanding of the gay community, that there are very feminine-looking men that are considered attractive, but there's also the concept of the bears, which are very beardy, masculine-looking men that are considered very attractive. So it would surprise me if there's something where, within a, a gay individual, uh, it's either going to track, the brain might track to find more masculine men attractive or more feminine men attractive, depending on maybe some sort of middle state of what you really consider yourself to be. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, so I think Synergy kind of points out this idea that, you know, intelligence, how does intelligence factor into, um, you know, mating preference and selection and chances of success? And I, I have two ways of thinking about that. Um, that one, 
the things that make us intelligent, what we consider like human intelligence, those may just be reflective of things that have to, that were related also to say good hunting skills in primates before civilization. So intelligence may be a way of displaying that, you know, we have lots of traits and uh, capacities. Uh, but again, I think with modern ways of thinking that, you know, your success as a professional in today's society, Western society, is so linked in many ways to uh, cognitive capacity, and not just intelligence, but maybe also social ability, uh, emotional intelligence, that these are things that are going to maybe evolve and develop in a slightly different way. Uh, yes, sorry, Suzuki mentions how homosexual men have moms that are very fecund. I think there's this one model for how, um, again, there, are, there is data showing that fourth, fifth, sixth, and subsequent children from the same mom have a higher prevalence of homosexuality. In, in, sorry, the male offspring of the male offspring from the same mother had this tendency. And so one thing I do get concerned about is that that's not a genetic component. That could be something where the amount of nutrition, the amount of supportive environment, or maybe even just the age of the mother have these effects on the likelihood of homosexuality in the male offspring. But I'm a female. I actually looked this up because I had a question um, from somebody about that a few months ago, and the, the data does not support that homosexuality in daughters has anything to do with um, with birth order. I mean, there's this concept, so, so spina bifida is a very more clear, obvious example, where as the spine is developing, the this one area doesn't finish closing, and so you have a bad development of, of, and that's actually related to a lack of folate in the woman's, in the mother's diet during pregnancy. And so you can imagine that either A, you know, having multiple children has kind of changed her physiology or she's older so her folate levels aren't as high, or maybe she's just so distracted by having multiple children that she's not getting adequate nutrition. And so, you know, these are things that I think birth order is something people are trying to understand a little bit better, but we don't necessarily have a strong chemical physiological understanding of everything that happens differently. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I, I missed the early part of the conversation. Like, one thing that's pretty amazing about humans is that we have this capacity to be very adaptable to different environments. We're not, like, the best at almost anything, but we're very good at a lot of things. Uh, again, I'm not sure, you know, these are things that definitely have trends of natural selection to them, so I'm not sure I want to go too much into that in the conversation about sexual selection. Are there any, any other things I can clarify? Any burning questions from the talk? Are there any odors associated with pair bonding in men? And you mean in the sense of a woman trying to, uh, that a man is detecting a woman's fertility cycle or something by smelling? I'm not aware of any. Um, one thing I will say is that there are a lot of visual signals that women display and that men are detecting. And I think one thing we kind of generally feel about men is that they do tend to be very visual. And so it may be that this physiology of smell is not as important, but it may also just be something that, you know, we quite, haven't quite found the right example or found or detected it in women being presented to men. So that was a good question, Susan. Axe body spray, yeah, so, you know, perfumes and colognes are kind of a, um, kind of an interesting topic, right? That we definitely associate certain things with smell that are good and bad. Um, 
And so clearly smell does have this, this key feature of, of what we do in our tech. But in terms of, as far as what I know the current research is, is that women are really to, trying to detect some degree of this interaction between males and females. So again, one thing that body sprays and deodorants will do is they will limit the growth of um, the bacteria that are on men. And so again, women do have smells. Again, don't get me wrong, women do have smells. And you can definitely say that a woman, absent any sort of fragrance, smells good or bad. And so I, I believe, Susan, that there is something related to that, but I don't, I don't know the science behind it or if anything's been specifically detected. Well, you know, perfume, my understanding of perfume, and that, or to, or in terms of our most recent Western civilization, is that, you know, once humans started living together in high concentration densities, things must have smelled really bad. Because basically, the streets were the bathrooms. Uh, people didn't have opportunities to shower very often because now the access to water was limited to, like, you know, outside the house. And, yeah, bathing was unpleasant, right? So, um, you know, of course people use perfumes to mask smells related to uh, dirtiness. And so, of course, you'd use that uh, for that purpose. Um, and that would be a part of a you know, mating game and selection. Of course, people who can afford good perfumes would be more attractive. But I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. People weren't necessarily using fragrances to try and be attractive to the opposite sex. They were just trying to not be disgusting to everybody would be another way of putting it. But I think, you know, I think there are some oddball things. Like when I think of like a woman wearing very flowery fragrance, I somehow I do have, you know, a sense of femininity to flower smells, right? Right. If, right. I would not wear, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a, a smell. Violet. I would not wear violet perfume myself to try and make myself attractive to the opposite opposite sex. And I don't see why a woman would wear like leather, the smell, scent of leather to be attractive to me. Because there are these like cognitive associations we do have. I don't know, but I think there was one video, if we just like, if men could just rub money smell on them, maybe that would help out. Chocolate, chocolate would be a great perfume. Yeah, vanilla. I mean, one of my favorite smells, scents is vanilla. I don't think I have any sort of necessary sexual attraction to that scent. But I do like the smell. So if you're introducing something that makes somebody feel happy, then maybe that is something that if you get this, like it's like Pavlov's dogs in a sense, that if you have this association of happiness with a person, then that starts creating that type of you know allure to a mate. Oh, good food. Yeah, I'm smelling like I don't know. Rosemary. Yeah, I mean, the thing I just want to point out, I, I think one thing, you know, our, our physiology is kind of meant to detect certain physiological signals. So artificial scents, well, they may play roles in some sort of degree of happiness or associations. I don't know that there's a lot of data suggesting that they, they are specifically genetically favored for detection. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again for coming. Thanks, Lynn Chantel. Good topic. Again, these documentaries are great. I recommend watching lots of documentaries. <laughs> Thank you.
I think I am going to go off voice. Have a good day, everyone.